We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. I appreciate so much everybody being here for our midweek Bible study. I have a couple of announcements before we get started. The first one is the W2 crew will be meeting this Friday at 1130 uh, down in the Fellowship Hall. So I hope if you're a part of that crew that you will be here for that. Also, Mark wanted me to remind everyone that we will be doing a Bible quiz this Sunday night, and we will be quizzing ourselves on Romans 15 and 16. So if you want to be preparing for that, it'll be Romans 15 and 16 this Sunday night. Also, Jeff Harbison, I was talking with him, and his mom has taken a turn for the worse, Carol Caldwell. So we definitely want to be praying for her and that family over the coming days. That's Carol Caldwell. Just uh, let's, let's keep praying, praying for her and that family. And also another announcement, uh, another family we want to keep in our prayers is a connection of me and Megan's. It's the Cadell family. They uh, went to church with us for a, a long time and then have gone to camp. And some of you may know them for there, but uh, their 17-year-old daughter, Chloe, was tragically killed this morning, uh, tragically passed away. Uh, and actually the mom lives here in Jasper. So we're going to see if there's anything we can do to help that family, but definitely be praying for that family here in the next coming days. Uh, they're going through a very difficult time right now. Luke is going to come and lead us in opening prayer. I'll have her sing and then Mark's going to bring us her 90 seconds of power. Luke. Bow with me, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here together tonight. As we sing and as we listen to what is said, uh, let's do so with open minds and with pure hearts and father help us to live every day that we have on this earth for you for your glory help us to take your word take the good news of your son to other people father please be with this church help us to thrive and continue to grow father we thank you for all that you've blessed us with thank you so much for your son jesus it's in his name we pray amen I found my Lord and He is my new one in my days love. I'll serve Him all my years of time and dwell with Him above. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. I found it so, I found it so. His service is my sweetest delight. His about to read is not original with me. I read it somewhere, so I've borrowed it. A Christian is not just somebody who has become nice. He is someone who has become new. A Christian doesn't just turn over a new leaf. He steps into a new life. A Christian is not like a tadpole who has become a frog. A Christian is more like a frog who has received the kiss of grace and become a prince. We are changed radically and dramatically. You know, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul teaches in the book of Ephesians, chapter number four. He speaks to those in Ephesus and he talks about how that they had learned Christ. He first talks about some of the sinful things that had gone on, but he said, this is not how you've learned him. But then he goes on beginning in verse number 22 and tells them, that they are to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, as we look at that, we see that there is that drastic change. But what I want to focus on for just a second is this. We are to put off the old self is the way the English Standard Version translates it. The word that's actually used there is the word from which we get our word, anthropos. 
uh, we have someone who is basically human. And so what he says is put off the old human and put on the new human. We have changed radically and dramatically. Now, the question is tonight, which one are you living? Are you living as the old human or are you living as the new human? If you've never become a Christian, you've never put on that new human. And as a result of that, you need to. But tonight, you have that opportunity while we're here together in order to be baptized for the remission of your sins. It may be tonight that you've done that in the past, but you still are living like that old human. And you need to change and be like that new human. And you may need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ. If we can assist you in any way tonight, come right now as we stand and sing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Two weeks ago, we began in Acts chapter number 13, we got to part of verse number one. That's where we are, where we'll start tonight. Let's go back and read verse number one. Now, they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, we were talking about last time, uh, these men who are named here, uh, we'd already talked about earlier uh, when we were talking about the church at Antioch that there were those who had come from Jerusalem and other places in order to help with the church there. But last time, we were down to the one by the name of Simeon. We talked about Barnabas, of course. Everybody remembers him. But Simeon, who was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene. Now, if you look at it, what I brought up the last time, it's uncertain if the word of Cyrene refers only to Lucius, who we'll talk about more in just a moment, or to both Simon, Simeon and Lucius. Now, when you think about that, it becomes quite interesting. When we start thinking about the man from, or the men from, the persons from Cyrene. And I gave you a little homework, and I hope you might have done a little bit of work on it as we were closing out, because I said it would be two weeks before I actually covered it again. And I asked the question, was Peter, well, let me ask this again first. Peter in the New Testament, the apostle Peter, what is his other name, or at least one of his other names? We know Cephas, but Simon, who is called Peter. And I asked the question, is Peter ever referred to as Simeon? who is called Peter. All right, that was your homework. Okay, anybody do it? Or did the dog eat it before you got here tonight? He might have chewed up your whole Bible, I don't know. What about it? Anybody want to take a guess? Is Peter, Simon Peter, ever referred to as Simeon Peter? Well, let's look and see. If we turn our Bibles to the book of uh, Acts chapter 15, go on over a couple of chapters. Let's begin reading in verse number 7. Acts 15, verse number 7. While you're turning there, Peter is referred to as Simon Peter 17 times in the New Testament. S-I-M-O-N. All right, now looking at verse uh, 7 of Acts chapter 15. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up, And said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now he's talking to those at the council of Jerusalem when they're trying to determine what the Gentile converts, what they needed to do, whether they needed to be circumcised and all of that. But now who stands up and begins talking there? Pretty clear, isn't it? Peter. Which Peter? Peter the... Apostle, we know it's the apostle because he identifies himself as the one through whom the Gentiles would be blessed with the gospel first. 
Is that what happened? Well, yes. All we need to do is go back to chapter number 10. We studied that quite a bit when we were talking about Cornelius. Now, for the sake of time tonight, drop on down to about verse number 13. Now, Peter talks in different ones. And in verse 13, after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Someone has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people of his name. Who was it? Depending upon which translation you're reading from, it's Peter, but how is he referred to here? ESV says Simeon. And as a matter of fact, the word Simon, when he's referred to as Simon Peter, that word is used a number of times in the, uh, well, like I said, he's referred to as Simon Peter 17 times. And if you look at the original word, it is Simon, okay? Translated Simon. But this word is not the word Simon. It's the word Simeon or Sumian or Simeon, S-Y-M-E-O-N, Simeon. And so in this uh, passage, how is Peter referred to? He is referred to by James as Simeon. All right. Let's go to the book of uh, 2 Peter, I think it is. First, yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. And basically the only one who's going to be left out is anybody using the New King James here. Okay? Because the King James and... Uh, most of the other translations put it this way. How does it begin? Simeon Peter. Simeon Peter, a servant, of the, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, King James Version even translates it Simeon in this passage. That's the same word that's used back in Acts chapter number 15. And also, the... the uh, American Standard Version, which has long been considered to be one of the most reliable translations, actually translates it with S-Y-M-E-O-N, which is one way of writing the word Simeon in the original language, from the original language. And so, indeed, Peter is referred to as Simeon. Now, what difference does that make? Are we ever introduced to a man... From, Simon, or from Cyrene, who is mentioned somewhere else in the New Testament. Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 27 at verse number 32. Matthew 27 verse number 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene... Simon by name, and they compelled him to carry the cross of Christ. If you turn to the Mark, in his account, Mark 15, verse 21, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Luke, in Luke 23, verse 26, the Bible says, and as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Now, is it possible to translate or to use Simon in one place and Simeon in another? Is it possible to do that? I hope you were listening because, yes, we just looked at Simon Peter or Simeon Peter. And so, yes, it is possible for that to take place. And so, is it possible here in the book of Acts, chapter number 13, that we have this Simeon from Cyrene, who is the Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross of Jesus? Is it possible? And then we're not told for certain but it is possible. Now here's another thing you might want to catch on to. 
In ancient writings, generally when a list of people is given, the most prominent person is put first and then in descending order. Descending order. Now who's the most prominent person in regard to the church at Antioch that we've been introduced to? So far. In Antioch, the most prominent person was Barnabas. He went and found Saul. They came back. They worked there a year. He'd been working with the church at Antioch. They send Barnabas around to different places. Barnabas is one of the most prominent. But now if it's true that this is put in the order of prominence, the second one is Simeon or Simon. Okay? And so how would this Simeon relate? If he had been the one who helped to carry the cross of Jesus, would that not have exalted him to a place of standing among the people? Now, I'm not saying that he is. I do not know. The Bible doesn't choose to tell us. But the thing that we look at and the thing that we're left to wonder, is that the case? He has a place of standing if everything is put in order. Somebody says, well, Saul is last. Yes, Saul is last. I want you to understand something. Saul has always been last when you're talking about Barnabas and Saul, so forth, until we get down later in this chapter after they have started the first missionary journey. He's not listed as number one on the list until we get down, even after they've gone to the first few places. It's Barnabas and Saul. And so, as we look at it, Saul is not prominent yet. In our minds, we know what Saul did, don't we? We know Saul wrote the majority of the New Testament. We know all of the things that he went through. We, we read what he said he went through for Christ. We know the transformation. We've already read parts of the book of Acts up to this point about his conversion. And so in our minds, he's number one on the list. But not yet. Not yet. He's not going to rise to prominence until just a little bit later in this uh, same chapter. And so, as we look at this man, it's very, very possible that this is that Simon who helped Jesus carry the cross. This Simon of Serene. And that would have helped to explain one of the things that we read back in Mark chapter 15. He's called Simon of Cyrene, but he's also identified as the father of Rufus and Alexander. Now, who are they? I don't know. But they must have been known to the people of the first century. And so they too were likely leaders in the church. If their father had been a leader here, it would lend more credibility to them being a leader in the church as well. And so we're just talking about Simon. Simon's also called what? Niger. What does Niger mean? Niger simply means black. Doesn't necessarily refer to his race or anything of that uh, nature. But he is simply referred to as Simeon, who is also called Niger. You know, one of the things that, uh, that impresses me about Acts chapter number 13 is that we see a lot about names in chapter 13. We're going to see about this man who is a magician, and we're going to see something about his name. We're going to see in Acts chapter 13, the Saul that we're reading about here, his name eventually down in chapter 13, it switches from Saul to Paul. And so there's a lot of idea, a lot of information in chapter 13 regarding names, okay? Let's talk about Lucius for a moment. Who is Lucius? Well, the one thing we know about Lucius is where he's from. He is from Cyrene. Some have tried to connect Lucius with Luke, the beloved physician, the one who actually is the penman of the book of Acts as well. 
but there's no real reason, no documents or anything of that nature that, uh, that would uh, actually connect that to make it that way. But the thing about it is, he was known by the people of Antioch and by God. Now, what is he known for? He's known for the same thing that some of these others are known for. And what were they? They were prophets and teachers. Okay? And so, whatever occupation or whoever he was, he was a prophet or a teacher. One or the other or both. Okay? And then the next one on the list, a man by the name of Manaen. Manaen. Now, the ESV says that he is a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that really doesn't do justice to what is actually said about him. The word friend is not even used in this passage, okay? And so, what is it that we're talking about here? Well, let's first establish who Herod the Tetrarch was. Who is Herod the Tetrarch? Is he ever mentioned in Scripture prior to this? The answer to that is yes. Okay. Sometimes he's referred to in history as Herod Antipas. Okay. But turn your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Luke chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now remember how he's referred to here. He is a, ESV says he's a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Okay? When we go back to the book of Luke chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, who do we begin reading about? Herod the Tetrarch. Now who is this Herod the Tetrarch? You look at the passage and you tell me who this Herod the Tetrarch is. Yep, that's him. Y'all know who he is. This is the man who executed John the Baptist. Okay? Who executed John the Baptist. That's Herod the Tetrarch. That's who it is. Same man. Okay? Now what about this lifelong friend deal in regard to Manaen, who is here in Antioch? Well, the original says that Manaen was a suntrophos of Herod the Tetrarch. This word is used a grand total of one time in the New Testament, okay? And it's used right here. But the word, according to Mounts, means nursed with another, one brought up with another, okay? Thayer says brought up with one, universally companion of one's childhood and youth, and lo and nigh to say a person offered parental care and or adoption along with the reference person, Herod the Tetrarch in this case, though not related by blood. Or we could simply say a foster brother. A foster brother. Childhood, childhood friend. All right. Uh, King James and the new King James said that he had been brought up with Herod. But the American Standard, again, I mentioned it a while ago, again, one of the most reliable translations believed uh, by some, actually translates it in this way, foster brother of Herod. The foster brother of Herod. Would you think he was an, a person of importance? If he had been in the, in the home, brought up with one of the men who was the leader of the nation, Herod the Tetrarch, a man powerful enough to have John the Baptizer executed because his stepdaughter asked for it, put up to it by her mother, okay? Pretty impressive man, is he not? And so when we look at it, it, it it's, it's interesting to me. Brother Wayne Jackson, in his comments, says once he was a foster brother to a butcher king, but now he is a brother to the king of kings. Pretty good, isn't it? 
a foster brother to a butcher king, but now he is a brother to the king of kings. Wow. And so when, we, when we're looking at these names, there's, there's a lot that is there. If we just read the names and we don't do a little research, we may not catch all of the significance of who these men are and, and how notable they were. And, and so this Lucius, though we don't know much about him, he was evidently, if, this, if it's correct that they put these in order of prominence down he was even a little more prominent than Manaean was, okay? But Manaean had to have been up there if he had been brought up as the stepbrother or foster brother to Herod the Tetrarch. He had been in a ruling family's home and grown up there. And so we've got him. We start out with Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manaean, and then finally we end up with who? Saul. We finally end up with Saul. Now we know a lot about him, and we're not going to talk about him at this juncture. All right, moving on to verse number two. Verse two says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now there's a couple of things that I want to take, uh, take note of here in this passage. While they were worshiping the Lord. Does anybody have a different translation of that word? If you have the King James, the New King James, American Standard Version, ministered. If you have the New American Standard or the Young's literal translation, ministering. And uh, the New uh, English translation, serving. But I sort of like the Bible in basic English on this place. Doing the Lord's work. While they were doing the Lord's work. Now, what does this mean? While they were worshiping. There are several words that sometimes are translated worship in the New Testament. Okay? And sometimes they're translated worship erroneously by the modern day translators. Okay? And so we have to be careful. Uh, for example, if you go over to Romans chapter 12, at verse number 2, uh, where he talks about our spiritual... King James says our reasonable service. I think the ESV says our spiritual worship. Well, the word that's used here is a word that uh, means... Uh, to perform some public service at one's own expense, or in the New Testament, to officiate as a priest to minister in the church. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew, um, numerous times it's used to refer to the service that priest rendered in their work. Okay? Does it mean worship? No, it means service or ministering to. Now look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 11. I said it was used a number of times in the Septuagint to refer to the priest and the work that they do. The work that a priest did wasn't the worship. They prepared the worship or the prepared the animals and the things for the people to worship. Okay? Just because they killed an animal and spread the blood on the altar or whatever they needed to do, whatever kind of offering they were making, did not mean that that was the worship. What they were doing was making it possible for the people to worship. If you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 11, the Bible says, And every priest stands daily at his, King James, or uh, ESV says, at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The word service there is our word translated worship over here in Acts chapter 13 verse 2. But here's another passage that should help us a little bit. Romans chapter 15 verse number 27. Romans 15 verse number 27. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. 
For if the Gentiles have come to share in the spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material things. Now this is the ones who have taught the Gentiles, and he's talking about the, the, the you know, the ones who have preached that that's, they're worthy of pay and being paid and so forth. But the word is the same word that's used over here in Acts chapter 13, verse number 2, translated service. If you put worship in that spot, how does it fit? We've got them worshiping men, don't we? And so it's not worship, it's service or ministering to. And so while they were ministering the Lord uh, to the Lord and fasting, okay, there's a difference between worship and service. I plan to preach some sermons later on this year in regard to worship. One of the grave mistakes that many people in our day and time try to make is that all of life is worship. Everything we do in life is worship. They'll argue that. Now, why would you want to argue something like that? Well, it makes way for instrumental music in the worship service. It makes room for women preachers and teachers and leaders in the church. It opens room for just about anything. And if that is the case, then we could have somebody come in on a Sunday and yodel and, and, you know, that would be perfectly good for worship. Or as I saw on Facebook this week, somebody had posted a thing in regard to worship and the, the idea that we're talking about now. And, and, and they, were, they said, all right, this Sunday morning, everybody's going to dress up like Dolly Parton. And we're going to get up on the stage and, and we're going to do... I forgot what, call, what dance they called, uh, one of those Baccarana or something like that, one of those old ones. And, you know, they, they, they kept adding on and said, if that's the case, then here, let's do that. Well, you see a problem with that? A very big problem. And so we need to understand, even when we're reading through scriptures, that those who translated these scriptures, they were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The ones who actually penned the original documents were inspired by the Holy Spirit. But these who translated were not. And so they sometimes made mistakes along the way. And so when we look at it here, they weren't worshiping. They were ministering to the Lord. They, they were doing their work for the church. They were preaching and Matter of fact, they're called what? Prophets and teachers. They're doing these kinds of things, okay? Not only were they doing that, but what's the second thing they were doing? They were also fasting. Now, where's the passage in the New Testament that commands us to fast? There's not one that commands us to fast. Why did people fast? Many in the Old Testament. The idea of fasting is to abstain uh, as a religious exercise from food or drink. That's what the word has to do with. There's nowhere in the New Testament that does that, or that commands that. But it was often done by Bible characters at times of great importance. Okay? Uh, when Jesus was out in the wilderness... What did he do when he's facing the devil for how many days? For 40 days. Y'all tried that? I haven't. Probably not going to. Just to be honest with you. Pretty tough. But he didn't command it. Okay? And so when we, when we look at it, it's usually done of, at times of great importance as when something was about to be initiated. Are they about to initiate something? Is something about to be initiated here? What? Launching out, preaching the gospel to the rest of the world, 
to the Gentiles. Okay? And so, while they were doing that, somebody said something to them. Who was it? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit tells them something. Now, before we leave the fasting thing, I had one more thing. You know, people sometimes don't eat when their mind is occupied or concerned about something or someone. If you have a sick child, which are you more concerned with, eating or the child? Most folks are more concerned with the child. Food doesn't really mean anything to us if we've got a child who's really, really sick. And, and, and you know, sometimes when it comes to fasting, in a religious sense, we may need to, to clear our minds, to focus our attention on those things that are truly important. And that's probably when we read those things in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, what those people were doing. All right, back to the Holy Spirit part. Who lets them know? Let me ask that question again. The Holy Spirit. Now, look, look toward the end of verse number 2. For the work which I have called them. When did the Holy Spirit call them? I thought it was Jesus who called Saul and gave him the job that he is about to be sent out to do. Was it not? If you go to the book of Acts and you uh, look at chapter 26 later on, he, Paul is recounting his conversion. Beginning in verse 14, notice what, he, what the Bible says. And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew, tongue, he, Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. If you drop on down for verse number 17, he says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Who's sending Paul, Saul, to the Gentiles? According to Acts 26. Who's sending him according to Acts 13? Oh, we're not done yet. If you go over to the book of Galatians, chapter number 1, verse number 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Who's added there as being the one who is sending Saul or Paul? God the Father. So now we've got three different ones who are sending Paul or Saul. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. Wow, all three persons of the Godhead were involved in calling Saul to this work, giving him the job that he is to do. Now, I, I would argue that that is always the case. Because does the Father think any differently than the Spirit? Does the Spirit think any differently than Jesus? Do they all think alike? Are they always in agreement? Yes. And so they're always involved in giving us, sometimes we see them in the, their different roles. Jesus came down to die for us, but who, who sent him? Several times. He is sent from the Father. Who told us about it? The Holy Spirit. All three of them are involved. And, and so to make a distinction in these different personalities, they are three different persons, but they're all one. 
And I don't know if you can get your mind around that or not. I can't. But I know it's the truth. And you know what? One day, I hope to figure it out. But it'll probably be after I'm there with them. Right? They are all three in such agreement that they are always referred to as one. Even when you go back into the book of Genesis, let make man in our own image. Us make man. Who was in agreement? All three. By whom was the world created? The Bible says Jesus is the creator. If you go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1, and John chapter uh, 1, Jesus is the creator. But now wait a minute. I thought God was. They're all three one. They may have a different part that they play at different times, but they're in such agreement that they are one. Three personalities and one. And so I, I thought I'd point that out because if you read back, when, when you get over to chapter 26, you're going to see Jesus doing the, the telling, descending, and now as we're looking at chapter 13, it's the Holy Spirit who is doing it. So we don't want to get confused. They're all three, as I've already shown, all three involved. All three persons of the Godhead were involved in calling Saul to this work. All right, moving on. Verse number three. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, What were they doing when the Holy Spirit... Spoke to them first. Ministering and fasting. What are they still doing? Fasting and praying. Okay? Fasting and praying. And so, what are they about to do? They're about to set out on one of the greatest missions that has ever been sent, on which a person has ever been sent in the entire history of the world. Going to the world, to the Gentiles, to preach the gospel. No wonder they're fasting and praying. Okay? Something else is said here. They laid their hands on them before sending them off. Why? Why would they lay their hands on them? Sometimes the apostles would lay their hands on people in order to do what? Impart a spiritual gift. Okay? But is that the case here? Probably not. Because if they laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, and they're trying to impart some spiritual gift to Saul, Saul said, hey, back up, folks. I've already got the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. He didn't need anybody to lay his hands on their hands on him to give him any power because he was an apostle with all of the same power. He was not inferior to any one of the apostles. And so it probably not to impart some spiritual gift. And so what is it? Well, I think the explanation is simply this. It is the ancient way or symbol I guess you might say, of giving approval to someone, showing their confidence in that person, and setting that person apart for some service or mission that they are about to undertake. You know, we read about the same thing happening over in the book of 1 Timothy, where uh, elders are laying their hands on some. And so, what is it? They're showing their confidence. It was their way of saying, God be with you as you go on this journey, as you do the work that you have been given to do. And so we have to make sure that we understand those things. Okay? Verse 4. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Okay? I had a map... And I spent this afternoon trying to work that thing where it would work really good. 
And somehow or other, it didn't save up here. So, uh, y'all do remember where Barnabas and Saul were. We're, we're told there in verse number one. They are in Antioch, okay? If you have a copy of a map, maybe in your Bible, the back or something like that on your phone, you can pull one of those up. And if you find Antioch, Antioch is right on, just off, the, off of the coast a little bit of the Mediterranean Sea. It's far north of Jerusalem. Uh, even Damascus is down below. It's, it's way on up high, okay? And so when you find Antioch, they're leaving Antioch, and the first place they're going is to where? Seleucia. Now, where's Seleucia? Well, Seleucia is just a few miles from Antioch on the coast. And so they leave Antioch, go down to Seleucia. What what'd they go to Seleucia for? To catch a boat. To catch a boat. I mean, there's that, that's why they went there. Do you think the people at Seleucia had already heard the gospel? If it's just four or five miles from Antioch? How long had Paul and Barnabas been working in Antioch together? For a whole year, they taught much people. And so, yeah, they probably had already heard. They go from Antioch to Seleucia to catch the boat. Okay? And so, from there, where do they go? They go over to the island of Cyprus. And again, if you're looking at a map of some kind, uh, you're going toward the west, and you find Cyprus. Okay? They go over to Cyprus, and where's the first city or town or village, whatever you want to call it, uh, that they come to on the island of Cyprus? Salamis. Salamis. It's right there on the, uh, on the eastern coast of Cyprus. And so they go from Seleucia, catch a boat, go over to uh, Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and the first place they go to is Salamis. And what did they do when they got there? They proclaimed the word of God. But where did they do that? That's interesting. They preached the word in the, not just a meeting place, but in the meeting place of the Jews, okay? Now, why did they do that? We know the what, but why? Go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Hold your finger there, and we're going to come back to it. And then turn back over to Acts chapter 3, verse 26. We'll look at it first. Acts chapter 3, verse 26. Peter and John are still in Jerusalem. They're preaching, teaching. And what did they tell the Jews there? God, having raised up His servant, sent Him to you first. And He always did that. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16... Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And he goes on to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What you're going to find from now on in the book of Acts is when Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas, when they first get to a new place, where are they going to go first? They're going to the synagogues. They're going to the Jewish people first. But for the most part, many of the Jews, what do they, what do they not want? They don't want Jesus. And so they turn away from it. And Paul's going to even tell them, hey, folks, you know, you've determined yourself not to be worthy of salvation. But when they reject it, what does he do? He goes on the mission that the Holy Spirit had sent him on to the Gentiles. And so they, they start out, very first place they go to preach, they start preaching at the synagogue of the Jews. 
And then what did they, who did they have? We've already talked about him, but who is this? So had somebody with them. Who is that? Who is John? What's his other name? John Mark. What else do we know him for other than running off and leaving Paul and Silas? Or Paul and Barnabas? What else do we know him for? Matthew Mark. He's the writer, penman of the gospel account called Mark. And so pretty, pretty uh, important guy. God would entrust him with, you know, writing a part of the New Testament. But they had John to, notice the word, assist them. He had them to, had John to assist The word translated assist here refers to one of a ship's crew, a minister, an attendant, or more notably a servant. A servant. John chapter 18 verse 36, one of the passages where this word is used. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants, same word that's used here, different from servant doulos or one of those that's used in a different place. He said, my servants would have been fighting. Acts chapter 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon your feet, talking to Saul. For I have prepared you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant. Now Paul was a servant. Paul was a servant to do what? Go to the Gentiles. That's back in that passage we were looking at a while ago. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, just because he was a servant doesn't mean that he was a slave. But it did mean he had some tasks to fulfill. He had jobs to do. He was there to assist them, to serve them in some way. Now, we're not told in what way. The Bible doesn't show us or tell us that. And... and, uh, Uh, Brother Bob Winton in his commentary says there would have been several jobs which John could have performed. And I like this, including baptizing people. He may have been one of the ones who baptized people, actually did it. Now why, why why do we bring that up? Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, says something. I'm glad I baptized none of you. But they were baptized. Who did it? Maybe somebody like John Mark. And so he had, a, he had helpers who were there. And when Paul was preaching and Paul was teaching and Paul convinced somebody, they didn't need Paul to do the actual work of baptizing them. They had other folks on hand who were helpers, assistants of Paul. And so when we look at this passage, John went to assist them. All right, we'll pick up in verse 6 next time because that's the, that's the second bell. Let's, let's close with a prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful again for your word, thankful for this opportunity to come together again and study from it. Father, bless us as we study it. Help us to understand it. Father, more importantly, help us to live it and to teach it to others. Father, we're mindful of those who are sick. We pray especially tonight for uh, Brother Eddie's mother, Betty. We pray that you will give her strength and comfort. We know that she's in a dire condition at this point. We also pray for the Dunn family. It's they mourn the passing of Charlie's mother. Be with them and comfort them and give them strength in the days and the weeks that are ahead. Father, there's so many others that we need to pray for, and we know that you know each one. But Heavenly Father, we We ask that if it's within thy will, that you will indeed bless them in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Be with each one of us as we leave this place. Go with us, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.